So good afternoon and welcome. You're very welcome to this webinar. Today we have a very full agenda for this afternoon and we have guest speakers Tanya Bonatti, Helen O'Donoghue, Patricia Kenny, to follow on from myself and my colleague Paula Melvin, uh, who's a Programme Manager at the Fulbright Commission. So speaking primarily about the programme to start with, I would say at Fulbright we do not primarily see ourselves as a funding agency but rather as facilitators of cultural exchange between Ireland and the United States. This very much impacts then our range of programmes, selection process and longevity. We invest in people, their passions and their impacts. Hopefully this and the flexibility of the programme, including the diversity, are your primary take home messages from today. So the programme's oranges were uh, beyond the Second World War, where Senator Fulbright in the United States, like many people at the time, were absolutely shocked and, um, you know, uh, had an abhorrence for what had happened during the Second World War. Their view was that people had behaved so atrociously against each other on the basis that they didn't really understand each other. They didn't see them as like them. They saw them as others. And his view, having been an, an exchange student himself at a, at a previous before the war, was that the best way to actually change that view of the other was to was to set up an exchange type of program where people could go and spend time in each other's countries and understand very much what they were about so see them as like-minded people his view i guess from where he came from was that education would be an ideal way to do that and that people who were involved in education would be influencers so the program was set up in in the the 1946 and the expectation at that time was that something like eight countries would join the program. Now in 2022, we're up to 180 countries who are facilitating programs. So it was, it's been wildly successful. Ireland joined the actual Fulbright program in 57. But in 1991, then, we set up the commission as it currently stands. So this was enacted as a, as a binational agreement between the United States and Ireland. And we have the commission that we see today. So what is Fulbright and what does Fulbright present for anybody listening on the call today? Well, at Fulbright, we're looking for, I mentioned, we're looking for investing in people. So we are looking for passionate and accomplished people. You can be categorized and it may not completely categorize who you are, but as students, as scholars, as artists, teachers and professionals. And I have to say that we are very focused on people from all disciplines to go and study research, teach, or lecture in the United States. So again, just to reiterate, what we're talking about today is an exchange program between Ireland and the United States. It does go in both directions. So we have Irish people like yourselves who would be seeking to go to the United States, but we also have Americans who, who very much would like to come and study or research or teach or lecture in Ireland. It is an unusual and a very special program. It can be a lifelong engagement. And I think some of those people speaking today will attest to that. It obviously has international prestige and recognition associated with it. But something you might be less familiar about is that it's actually considered a family. We often talk about the Fulbright family. And that I think is testament to the longevity of the program, which has been over 75 years in existence and, and its global outreach because it is a global family. It's not just between Ireland and the United States, but many other Fulbrighters, many other of your peers in Ireland and around the world will have taken up this opportunity, gone to the United States or come from the United States to our countries and created that connection and that family. And it is very much. And I think as you research and you look into Fulbright, you will understand that somewhat better. So what do the awards provide? Well, there's a monetary grant, we provide visa administration, which sometimes can be not inconsiderable. We provide accident and emergency insurance. But beyond that, then we would have a, quite an amount of cultural and professional programming. And there's obviously an ongoing support and links to a global network, uh, the Fulbright alum, and engaging with the Commission and engaging with your hosts and engaging with uh, the US State Department and all of the parts that combine to make this global program. So it is a big program. It is a big family. It has big outreach. It has a lot of positives that are not necessarily just based on financial. 
you know, I think for many people who've gotten other awards that they might consider that they didn't necessarily become an alum of that, of that award. I certainly didn't for some of them that I received, but it's really about the people and it's the people that make Fulbright special. The experiences can be wildly varied, but very often people come back and they talk not necessarily about the work they did, but the real focus is the experience they had and the engagement that they had. And that's actually a job done from a Fulbright point of view. So the award categories are a number of different areas. I think we're going to primarily talk about the Irish Student Awards and the Irish Scholar Awards today. Just to advise when we say student, we mean somebody who's engaged with postgraduate research. So for a master's or a PhD. If we talk about scholars and scholars and professionals, we talk about somebody who has a PhD already, or they have five to seven years professional experience, usually relevant to the area that they might be applying to the Fulbright Commission on. We do have a very specialised award called the Irish Tech Impact Award, which again may or may not be of interest to some of the people who are applying uh, for a Fulbright on this call today. Having said that, I don't want to put you off, so you might consider that there is some value. You don't have to be the, the ICT person. It could be that there's value for ICT in where you want to go and assess some, some other systems in the United States. And just as a small aside, there's a program that operates from December through the Belgian Commission called the Fulbright Schumann Awards. And as students and scholars from Ireland, you could apply to that. Typically, that's looking at policies or programs that are wider on an EU or a US level. We have a number of sponsored awards, including awards with Creative Ireland, and we're going to talk about those specifically today. Again, I might make the comment to say you can be a little bit creative and innovative when you look at other awards. So if you feel that the awards we're specifically talking about today are not necessarily relevant to you, please double back and look at the other sponsored awards. I can say that most of the sponsors are very willing and very interested in holistic approaches to the subject areas, something you might not have considered, but can be equally value. We have a significant list of awards as well. I'm going to talk about just a couple of those in a minute, but if you require any more details, I would advise you to go look through the Fulbright website at fulbright.ie. So I'm not going to spend really any time going through these specific full lists of awards here. The first award I do want to talk about that I think is relevant to any of the presentations, any of the webinars that we give is actually the All Disciplines Award. And the re reason I say that is because it is essentially what it says on the tin. It is an All Disciplines Award. We have artists, we have judges, we have professors in biotechnology, we have ICT specialists across a whole range. We have professionals coming from industry who apply for these awards. And really it's we're again, as, as we say, we're very interested in the people. So it's very much up to you to, to present what you want to do and why you want to do it. So the Student All Disciplines Award is for people who want to complete a PhD or a master's in the United States or somebody who's already on a program there and they want to carry out further research or maybe actually apply for um, uh, you know, the first year or uh, any number of years of a postgraduate award. I will say that Fulbright as funding is only available for the first year of your research or study. I can say that many people find that having a Fulbright is great leverage in the United States if you need to seek out additional funding both in Ireland and in the United States. So again, student awards are postgraduate awards effectively. Scholar and professional awards, again, available in all disciplines. Uh, these and the student awards are actually open to Irish citizens or EU citizens who have been resident in the Republic of Ireland for the last five years or more. And again, the idea is to undertake research uh, or study or uh, teach or lecture in the United States. And again, they are open to all areas of research. So for, I think, anybody on this call could apply for, assuming that they meet other eligibilities that we'll talk about later on. But in terms of discipline, you could apply for this award. If you find subsequent awards don't fit exactly with what you want to do, certainly you could apply under the, the All Disciplines Award. Now we're here today, today to talk as well about the Fulbright Creative Ireland Award. The Fulbright Creative Ireland, um, Partnership 
has been ongoing for a number of years since since 2016 when we kicked off our discussions and it's been very very useful in in a number of ways one i think as a a focus point for people in the industries that that many of the people on the call today are probably coming from. It's a recognition. They understand Creative Ireland and they feel then the link through to Fulbright. And that's been very positive for us. And we're very happy with that programme and we will be very happy to continue on with our programmes. In fact, we have extended the programme over the last couple of years and we'll come to those specific awards in a, in a few minutes. So one of the awards we're talking about is the Fulbright Creative Ireland Museum Fellowship Award. It's a student award going to the Exploratorium in San Francisco. It's a, an excellent uh, institute. They're highly, highly regarded, quite famous, particularly in their own region, which as we know, it's significantly bigger than Ireland. But uh, for people who live in the area and for researchers in the area. It's, you know, it's a, it's a great hub of activity and it's quite ingenious and innovative in what they want to do. And they're very much like many of our own museum and similar institutions. They've had a quiet time over the COVID years and they've very much opened up and they're ready to receive. And they're very, very supportive of a Fulbright application to it. So it is for three months. It's for students or scholars. It's for our, our an Irish uh, citizen or an EU citizen living in Ireland for five years. So PhD students or postdoctoral scholars are invited to apply for this programme in San Francisco. And it is uh, an excellent opportunity for somebody who, if you take the time and effort to have a look at what the innovation that goes on at the Exploratorium, you may well find something that, that will fit with your interest. Again, I think they are looking for creativity and community engagement as part of what they're very much interested in. So this is a student a scholar award. Talking about another award then is the professional award. For some of the people on the call, I'm hoping that this is this has piqued your interest and this is something that you will have, we, we have tried with uh, Creative Ireland to craft this type of an award to maybe even though the all dis disciplines will allow for application, we wanted this to be more embracing or more understood by, by some of the people who are applying, particularly as a professional who has maybe in, been involved in development of programs, running programs, uh, perhaps research, or if not research, but engaged in management and aspects of their own programs here in Ireland, and want to go and learn more, or want to bring those programs to colleagues in the United States. Again, we're looking for people who are interested in going on a Fulbright, people who are interested in the opportunities that that opens up, and I guess there are some key eligibilities which uh, we can talk about in general terms and I think Paula will talk about a little bit as well. But it's very important that you demonstrate a rationale for where you want to go and why it has to be in the United States. So this award does not have a particular home in mind. But again, it should make sense to you. It should make sense for why you need to go to this place in the United States. And we would say there are a key part there is that it's to understand what it means to be a Fulbrighter. You must be an Irish citizen or a EU citizen living in the Republic for five years. You cannot be a dual US Irish citizen or a green card holder or currently living in the United States or applying from the United States. We also say that you, you should not have extensive recent experience of studying or living in the United States. We appreciate people may have already spent some time in the United States. It might have been somewhat time ago, and it may have been somewhere very different in the United States from where you are considering to go now. So again, don't be put off by this. If you have a specific query about that, or you feel that you may have had too much extensive experience in the, in the United States, please do contact the Commission. So one of our other directed awards then is to go to the Harry Ransom Centre in the University of Austin, Texas. Again, this is a very exciting uh, opportunity for people to go and study very often actually Irish Irish um, uh, records and Irish uh, history in, in the Harry Ransom Centre. But again, I would say to people to please go and have a look at what's going on in there. Again, they're quite an innovative group and they are expanding as well uh, past uh, the COVID the COVID kind of lockdown and all the elements associated with that. This is very much for a postgraduate student and it's for three months. 
So please do take a look at this as well. And another very exciting um, uh, targeted award we would have is going to the Smithsonian. I've always considered S Smithsonian probably should have had an S at the end of that because it's obviously for anybody who's spent any time there realized that it's a, there's a, probably more available there than you will ever get a chance to see with so many different institutions. I think at least 17. And again, some of those are broken down into different locations uh, in themselves. But this this is for a student. This is to go for six months. Again, it has a similar eligibilities. And just one specific aspect is that um, the Smithsonian asks that applicants would demonstrate a commitment to innovation and creativity and include substantive community engagement as part of their applications. So there would be in all of these director programs, you will be, you will be sent to specific parts of, of the institutions where they will deal with your application. The Smithsonian program is related to one of their uh, uh, visiting student programs, so there are eligibilities and requirements to fit with that. But they have managed this before. They're well aware of Irish Fulbrighters applying for this, so please do consider going there. Um, if you have multiple areas that you're interested in, again, there might be an opportunity to go to more than one part of the Smithsonian, particularly if they're if they're all co-located in Washington D.C. But um, I. I've said this many times before, I think if I was eligible to apply and I was a student who was eligible to apply, this is probably the ward I would go to. Having spent some of my days living in DC, uh, traversing the different Smithsonian institutions, uh, it, it could be an amazing experience. And Patricia, who's going to talk to you today, will be able to attest to that. So just as a comment, we also have for in this area, we have two museum awards. So the Irish Museum of Modern Art have for many years been hosting US scholars who, who wanted to come to Ireland to study. And the Hugh Lane Gallery, Dublin City Gallery, Hugh Lane, have also been hosting for a number of years students who've come to, US students who've come to Ireland. And, you know, I think they, the students and the people who've gone the Fulbrighters who've taken these awards would be very open to being contacted if you wanted to understand the institutions they come from and whether there is an opportunity to, to reconnect with them. So we just put this here as a piece of advisory information. So uh, Paula is going to go through in more detail, but I'll just say that our awards are open. So establish your eligibilities, demonstrate a strong rationale. I can't under, uh, undervalue that. Really, why do you know you need to go to the United States? You must comply with a two-year home rule visa requirement. So under the, the visa, this is a global requirement. If you go to the United States under this visa, then when you must spend two years back in Ireland in order if, and that is only relevant if you decide at some other time that you want to get a longer term uh, residency in the United States. If you don't, well, then it's no issue in any in any case. You cannot be a dual Irish citizen. You cannot be living in the United States. And as we mentioned about the extensive experience in the United States. So at this point, I'm going to pause my discussion and I go to hand over to my colleague, Paula Melvin. Paula is the Senior Awards Manager at the Fulbright Commission. So she has extensive knowledge and I'm sure many of uh, the applicants or inquiries have already come through this, so, some initial discussion with Paula. So Paula, I'll pass on to you. Thanks, Melinda. Dara. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people on this call. And additionally, I'm delighted that we have a few questions there in the Q&A already. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the question, questions box and we'll do our best to answer them. So the application timeline is quite similar every year. Towards the end of August, the application period opens for Irish applicants who want to go to the United States and Fulbright. And um, this year, the application period will close on the 27th of October. Please note your references, referees also have the same deadline that you do. So 27th of October is that key date. Uh, between November and December, Anthony, the Scholars Awards Officer, and I will be very busy sourcing uh, experts to review your application, experts in your field. Then in early 2023, um, some of you will be called for interview via Zoom. And, and then in March, we kind of have the happy experience of telling people that they were successful, if so. So now that the application period has been open for just over a month, and um, it is definitely a good idea to start reviewing the information on Fulbright.ie. 
choose your award. I know a lot of you will be interested in the three Creative Ireland Student Awards in those three fantastic institutions that Dara mentioned. And as Dara said, Smithsonian in particular have numerous different uh, museums around Washington, DC, but also please note if you're a scholar who's interested in a Creative Ireland opportunity, you can go to anywhere in the US pretty much under that Creative Ireland Scholar Award. So please consider the breadth of opportunities across the United States. And we're very passionate about diversity and diversity naturally means a lot of things. It also means diversity of institution in the United States. And um, so find a course, plan your research proposal, research what it means to be a Fulbrighter. That is vitally important um, because Fulbright is about people and register your interest on fulbright.ie. Uh, next slide, please. And once you register your interest on Fulbright.ie, depending if you're a student or scholar, myself or Anthony will send you the relevant guidelines. And um, so finding a host, who do you want to work with? So seek experts in your field, talk to your lecturers or your colleagues. Where, If you ring the office and ask us where to go, you'll know best your research. Where are the experts in your particular field? Like I said, we really welcome diversity. So we kind of want people to go all over the United States from all over Ireland. We want this to be, it is a meaningful engagement between people of the United States and people in Ireland. Um, so reach out to Fulbright on Irish, uh, US and Irish alumni. Um, use existing Fulbright links, the sponsors naturally, select a host institution, um, but it really should make sense. I want to go to this place in Florida because there's this lecture or this museum or whatever that do things that we don't do in Ireland or there's a certain archive there that I want to have access to. But it should really be like, I want to go to Massachusetts or I want to go to Minnesota because blah, blah, blah. It really should make sense to you. And um, so then the applicant require, the application requirements and um, so personal information on your CV. And um, so the CV is an opportunity to tell us your journey. But please do not rehash your CV in the Fulbright statement and the project statement. And um, the CV is maximum six pages for scholars. And um, you need three recommenders who, like I said, have the same deadline to submit that you do and a copy of the bio page of your passport. And um, next slide, please. Uh, oh, samples of work for artists. So we do want three hard copies of the sample of the work for artists and a letter of affiliation for researchers and scholars. Now, if you're a student who's applying to go to the US on a master's, we understand that the application deadlines do not always kind of align perfectly for Fulbright and for the thousands of institutions in the States. So it is fine if you cannot have a letter of affiliation or a letter of acceptance if you're going to do a master's in particular because they may not have announced who has been accepted onto the course but where possible it'd be great to have those letters of affiliation for researchers and um, so preparing your application the research objectives then why is your work groundbreaking and um, you really need a strong rationale for going to the US and um, identify the specific area or areas you will concentrate on and explain your objectives and expected results and what impact this will have on your discipline research and career and then the Fulbright statement, which you could also really call a personal statement because it is talking about you personally. So Fulbright, like I said, is really about people. So tell us about you as a person. So your personal and professional ambitions, your motivations for applying for this award and your interests, what you hope to achieve in the US and then upon your return. And Dara mentioned the lifelong engagement piece as the Fulbrighters who are on this call I'm sure I will mention it really is there's loads of opportunities to engage when you come home from the States, your Fulbright doesn't have to end there. We have the Irish Fulbright Alumni Association. We obviously have the Irish Commission and there's the Ireland United States Alumni Association as well. So there's so many ways to kind of give back and engage. The role and benefit of being a Fulbrighter, I really cannot emphasize this enough. Really do your homework on what it means to be a Fulbrighter. And we don't want you to kind of disappear into a museum or a lab or a classroom. What are you going to do outside that museum or lab or classroom? What are you going to, what else are you interested in? So if you're an artist, but what else are you going to do? Or if you're, say, a mathematician, I'd say the same thing on a different call. What are you interested in the US? Do you want to climb, do you want to visit loads of different national parks in the US? Are you interested in learning a new sport? What are you going to bring back outside of your research to Ireland? And what part of Ireland are you going to bring there? So then the review and the interview. 
So at the review stage, it's really about your kind of academic record or kind of artist as in your track record of an artist and your project statement and less so about the cultural engagement and leadership. However, at the interview stage, odds are the people on the interview panel will not be in your field. They could be a mathematician, they could be a historian, they could be from different fields. And um, so at the interview stage, the emphasis is more on the cultural engagement and the leadership and less on the academic record and project statement. Uh, so Fulbright Awards are really about people and their engagement. And we do really want people who have that kind of leadership um, capacity, who'll be leaders in the field. So resources, we have wonderful Fulbright ambassadors on pretty much every third level institute campus across um, the Ireland. So say in DCU, for example, we have someone who went on a Fulbright and who is based in DCU. So you can obviously approach us in the commission and we are happy to help, but it is also great to touch base with someone in your home institution um, who has actually undertaken a Fulbright Award. We have numerous alumni videos and testimonials um, or our YouTube channel is fantastic. We record these webinars and put them up there. Um, Fulbright events. Um, there's, like I said, the Fulbright Ambassadors. There's a lot of support in the different HEIs around the country and we're very grateful to our Fulbright alum for that volunteerism. And you can follow Fulbright affiliate groups as well on social media. And then I think the next step, oh, diversity inclusion. So we welcome candidates from underrepresented communities, area research, home organizations and HEIs, geographical areas, ethnicities and abilities. So Fulbright's about people, so please share who you are. And that's something we're very passionate about in the commission. And next slide, please. Next steps. So I'd strongly urge you to reach out to your recommenders now. Select your host institution or host institutions if you're going to more than one. Um, research that Fulbright ethos, talk to Fulbrighters, follow us on social media, we're particularly strong on Twitter. If you have any queries, please reach out to awards at fulbright.ie and visit our webpage on fulbright.ie. And it is my absolute pleasure now to introduce you to Tanya Bonatti, who's the Director of Creative Ireland. Hi everyone, lovely to see you and I can see some collaborators and former colleagues as attendees of this webinar. Look, I'm just here to say that the Creative Ireland programme is really delighted to be a sponsor of these awards. Um, I've put or will put the website for Creative Ireland in the chat for you all. But basically, a little bit of background about the programme and why we support the Fulbright. We're an all of government programme with a very hairy ambition of embedding creativity across policy, government policy, national and local, and thinking about the, 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 the growth of the creative sector and its talents and capacities. So when Fulbright uh, approached us when we were just getting set up four years ago, we thought this was a fantastic opportunity to offer a number of Irish people really wonderful opportunities with the Fulbright in the States. And that will come to pass when you hear about some of the people who've gone. So I'm really here to urge you to have a think about applying. I know that some of you on the call will go, I'm not with a higher education institution. I'm not doing a master's or a PhD. Please, that is fine. Um, please don't be put off by the application process which talks about publications. As Dara has said, we want a large number of people from the creative sector to apply. You have all kinds of things there. There's a, a smorgasbord of opportunities for you. There are the Smithsonian institutions, 19 in all, the wonderful Exploratorium in San Francisco, the Harry Ransom Centre. And lastly, we worked with Dara and his team to throw the doors wide open. So there is a professional opportunity for anybody in the creative sectors. And that doesn't just mean artists. It's anybody working in the arts and wider creative sectors. That includes heritage, architecture, design, as well as the areas we would normally think of the arts, film, music, theatre, opera, dance, etc. So in other words, Fulbright really wants to welcome the creative sector to the Fulbright programme. And they are known for really helping people with their application. Their, uh, Helen, who many of you will know on this call, I'm sure will be very happy to talk you through her experience. We hear nothing but positive feedback from the people who've gone. It's an absolutely fantastic opportunity. And like I say, you are not constrained 
by the um, museums and institutions who have offered to host you. Um, you are not constrained by the museums and video. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I keep being told to start my video. Um, uh, you're not constrained by uh, the museums and galleries. There really is any array of opportunities, particularly for the professional fellowship. It's up to you to identify what will be the creative organization you would like to link with. So just to really encourage applications, we're delighted to be supporting these awards. We're interested to see what applications come through. And I'll hand over to two graduates who can talk you through their experiences. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Tanya and Dara and Paula. Yeah, I've been asked to talk about three, three key points. My experience of Fulbright, uh, the impact of my career and some tips around the application. So I have a couple of slides really to bring you into the, the wealth of experience that I had. So next slide, uh, Dara. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been working in the Irish Museum of Modern Art, recently retired for 30 years. So the opportunity to apply for Fulbright came at a really key moment, both in my own professional development, but also in the development um, of the museum strategy, which was to start begin to look at our 30 year history through our archives. Next slide. The proposal that I put forward to Fulbright and was accepted was to look at the archival practice in the, in the Museum of Modern Art. Now, I'm not an archivist. I was interested in the content, but I was also very interested in how, after 80 years, which MoMA turned 80 in 2019, how the education team there were using their archives in order to inform their current practices. So I split my time between the physically between the archives and between the live programs that were happening in the galleries. Next slide, please. So I was welcomed. I have to say one thing about the Americans. Professionally, they are incredibly generous. Nothing is too much to ask of them. And before and after any meeting that I had, not just in the Museum of Modern Art where I was based, but across all of the institutions that I connected with, people would send me information either before or certainly after a meeting. So I, it was a really, really rich resource for my thinking and my development as a professional. Next slide, please. So as I said, I split my times between um, the archives, which are sited there between 53rd and 54th Street, and um, uh, also attended uh, or participated in some of the live programmes, one in particular that I was looking at. So I was able to spend time both as a participant in programmes, which was a real, uh, a, a wonderful opportunity as a professional to step out of my day-to-day -day work in the Irish Museum of Modern Art and step into somebody else's programme, both with the opportunity to participate in those programmes and also to avail of the expertise and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges that uh, ultimately were opened up to me. Next slide, please. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity, and, and this is what I think people say so often about Fulbright, is you don't know what you're going to get until you arrive. So one of the things that was really exciting that I discovered was that in, res in, our, in researching their archive, MoMA also unearthed an incredible wealth of um, post-war movements in terms of psychology, arts, education. So I was deeply um, embedded in opportunities to both learn about, read about, and see authentic materials in the archive that related to people that I had been write, reading about um, throughout my career, like John Dewey or Maxine Green um, and others. Um, so the opportunity to spend time there was invaluable and continues to be invaluable uh, in my ongoing research. Next slide, please. So, as I said, I had an opportunity to look at and work with and alongside um, the education team in MoMA who were testing out new ideas based on experiences previously. Um, next slide, please. And uh, in particular, to spend time in this one um, studio programme that had been introduced, um, which subsequently on my return to Ireland, 
um, informed how we approached the IMA Outdoors mm. program. Next slide, please. And next slide. I've chosen this slide really because, again, a non surprising outcome of my time in MoMA was that aspect of having time, time away from the day to day to do list in Ireland and time to really, really reflect and think as a professional and as a personal and, and personally uh, about my own creativity. It was really a pivotal time in relation to somebody like me who is at a latter part the, of my career and has given me a real incentive of how I'm going to organise my time now that I've retired from IMA. So I see it as a career opportunity, but I also see it as a lifelong opportunity. And as Dara has already mentioned, what's really fantastic about the Fulbright is the, the opportunity to link with international partners. I've always valued the international throughout my career, but having been embedded in the States for the four and a half months has opened up doors that previously wouldn't have been open to me because I've been able to meet people on a one-to-one, -one, personally, face-to-face. -face. And whilst the pandemic has completely ripped apart the museum world, um, what has been really important is that the connections that I made just pre-pandemic continued via Zoom calls, facilitated by Fulbright formally, facilitated informally by my colleagues across the States and further afield indeed, so that there, I feel more connected um, with the, my profession than I ever did before. So whilst I had plans on return uh, to create a whole lot of inter-institutional exchanges that couldn't happen because of the pandemic, the connections there um, nonetheless have been maintained and will continue. Next slide, please. Mm. So just in terms of uh, that, my experience there, as I say, it, it was just fantastic to be living in Man Manhattan. Um, it is difficult to get accommodation there, which will probably be picked up before the end of this call. But living in a city like Manhattan, you know, every day something new happened for me, being able to walk that city um, and traverse it and visit the various boroughs, um, five boroughs of New York were all really, was really, really stimulating and um, connecting, as I said, professionally. Uh, the um, importance of, uh, in relation to application, um, a couple of tips. I was fortunate because my work um, and my connections with the States went, right, went back into my career and I had worked with the Museum of Modern Art and with the Head of Education, Wendy Woon, on a number of projects. So in 2018, I was in the States and she and I began to discuss the potential of my applying to Fulbright. So she uh, was willing to act as a host. I, had look, I did look at the Creative Ireland Awards, but unfortunately, um, MoMA isn't one of the um, host institutions under that award. So I applied to the All Disciplines Award. Um, I think the project outline was simple enough because we had a, a, a program of work in IMA that I wanted to uh, test out through my research in MoMA. Probably more challenging for an Irish person is the personal um, statement. So uh, really to be able to sit back and actually appraise your own achievements and be proud of those, which uh, the, that comes very naturally to people in the States, but probably less so for Irish people. But it also did give me an opportunity to really think about why, why the States, why, why America, why New York, why uh, MoMA. And it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on all of the writing and readings that I had uh, immersed myself, not just in relation to the professional aspect of, of museum pedagogy and education, but also further afield to the musicians, writers, and other creatives that I that I am have always been interested in. Um, it was important to to uh, select the people who are doing the review or the reference uh, wisely. So I looked at I talked to people who knew my me and um, throughout my career and uh, got three diverse people to to write that those references on my behalf. And importantly, because I had had the opportunity to connect with MoMA before I went. 
it also facilitated uh, dealing with a, a changing situation because I was to work with a particular researcher in MoMA and on the week I arrived, she was leaving. And I know this is quite common uh, that time between time elapses between the application and uh, actually visiting your host institutions, things can change. But because I had all had a number of colleagues there that I connected with, I was able to be a bit versatile and uh, adapt and do 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 the work that I was hoping to achieve. So I think in summary, um, it's an amazing experience. I can't praise Fulbright highly enough. The, the award is for you. It is for your personal and professional development. And uh, once you've been awarded a Fulbright scholarship, you're supported to see that through, through your experience. And having come back after my period in America, Fulbright is continually uh, supports what I'm doing in my work professionally and personally. Thank you. Oh, Many I, thanks. I, I should, sorry, I, I should introduce Patricia Kenny, who's also been an award recipient. Patricia's going to speak now. Hi, um, so my name is Patricia Kenny, um, as Helen said there. Uh, so I'm just finishing up final stages of my PhD in UCD, and I'm an archaeologist. So I was a 2019-2020 Creative Ireland Museum Fellowship um, awardee. I went to the Smithsonian. Um, specifically, I went to the, uh, the National Museum of Natural History. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. But basically, um, so what I'm really interested in is like how past societies um, explained the world around them, particularly when it comes to geological features. How did people from the past understand or explain things like fossils? Um, and currently I'm looking at that through my PhD that, is, well, I was looking at that, I've just finished. Um, so looking at how European people in the Stone Age um, might have connected belief systems or knowledge systems to fossils and how you can trace that through the archaeological record. And during my PhD in the first year, I think I was reading this book, um, The Fossil Legends of the First Americans, and it looks at sort of um, knowledge systems and stories and folklore that was attached to fossils by Native American groups, by all of the different groups across America. And I thought it would be really, really interesting to see how that is reflected in the archaeological record. Can you trace that back through time? Um, and I was talking actually to a friend of mine, David Stone, who had been awarded this um, award previously. And he told me that I should stop talking about it and just apply for a Fulbright <laughs> and get out there and, and look into it. Um, and I'll be honest with you, like, I really didn't think that this was for me. I, I suppose I found it kind of intimidating. Um, I, I just wasn't sure if, if, if it was something that would suit me at all. But David kept pushing and pushing. And so eventually I looked it up and I decided that I would apply. And honestly, I really owe David on this one. It was one of the best decisions that I made to apply for this award because it was just fantastic um, from a research perspective, but also from a personal perspective. So um, the first thing that I did when I was like thinking about applying was I actually reached out to the author of this book, Adrian Mayer. Uh, she's a researcher in Stanford. And I told her what I was thinking of doing, what I was interested in. And I kind of outlined the different options because at that time I wasn't sure which award would suit me best because there are so many different awards uh, offered by Fulbright. Um, and she, when she heard there was an award associated with the Smithsonian, she told me that is the one that you need to go for because there is so much in the Smithsonian that I haven't had a chance to look at. And so I did, um, and I went and there, even that, even narrowing in on which institution within the Smithsonian was a whole, uh, process. Um, they 
so I went to the National Museum of Natural History, but I was talking to people from the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, I had arranged to go to the uh, Smithsonian Arctic Study Center in Anchorage in Alaska. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, and when it hit, I wasn't actually able to get there. But, <laughs> you know, the, just because you're, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that you might have a hub within where you're applying to, but that doesn't mean that you can't go to all of these different places and be connected to all these different institutions under kind of one umbrella. Um, so my hub was the National Museum of Natural History. Um, and I suppose, what I would say is that if you're at all interested, even if you just have kind of a, an inkling of an idea, put it together and just write it up and, and apply because, yeah, I I would not have applied if, if it hadn't been for um, David encouraging me. I just, I thought that this idea was kind of, um, well, it wasn't, it wasn't a Fulbright idea, if you know what I mean. And I, it was one of the best decisions I made to apply for this award. Um, when I got over there, I mean, America is what struck me. So I don't know anybody in America, or I didn't at the time. Um, I didn't know anybody in America. I had never been to America. I was just struck by like the sheer size of everything in America. When I got there, the buildings are massive. Um, it was a real culture shock for me. Uh, I think the second week that we were there, we had a uh, gun drill, so what to do if there's a, an active shooter, which was a little bit jarring, but I will say, like, the people there are amazing, so um, all of the different people, when I got there, um, my contact, Stephen, uh, Dr. Stephen Loring, he showed me around to all of the different department heads that I might be interested in, or that I might need to know, um, they were all so, so friendly, like Helen was saying, they just, like, it was kind of intimidating at first because they were these kind of, they're, they're obviously they're working in the Smithsonian, they're well known within their fields. Um, uh, but they are all so, so friendly and willing. They knew, once they knew that I didn't know anybody there, they went out of their way to, to, to make me feel comfortable. Um, I went to a lot of events in the first couple of weeks that I was there. Um, my approach was sort of like, just go to everything because I didn't know anybody and I needed to make some friends. So I was that annoying person uh, who was kind of going up to groups of complete strangers at uh, different exhibits and trying to get to know everybody. Um, the Smithsonian is great in that way and being in, in, a, in a kind of a museum setting I found was great in that way because there's always different exhibits opening and there's different, uh, like there was a film festival on one weekend um, and yeah, you just really need to, once you get over there, people are friendly, um, but you do need to take the initiative and be the person who like invites people out or who goes up to the group and introduces yourself. Um, I found like, so there was one of, one of the interns that she was a dog walker, uh, after kind of on the weekends and stuff like that and I tagged along with her I kind of invited myself as a co-dog walker and <laughs> after walk dogs and I managed to see a lot of kind of Washington's parks and stuff like that through that sort of um, social aspect of things. Um, working in the Smithsonian itself was really really interesting um, so I was I had a little office in the Museum of Nat National uh, sorry the Nat National Museum of Natural History. Um, but I spent most of my time out in this warehouse where they keep the collections. Um, and it was just amazing, even, even just to see the things that they have there. Up on the top floor of one of the buildings, they, they just have an area that's dedicated to mammoth skulls. Um, so you're walking through all of these different, um, like just these, these mammoth skulls left and right. Uh, there was another section where they had just casually a triceratops, like the little recognizable little horn, the front part of the skull um, out on, somebody was doing some sort of work with it. I don't know what they were doing, but it was just amazing to get to see all of these different disciplines working together. And it was just so enjoyable. Um, 
so yeah, I suppose what I would say is if you're thinking about this, if you have an idea, do apply. It'll be a wonderful experience. Um, when you're applying, you might need to get in contact with people over there. Um, sometimes they won't get back to you. That's probably because they're busy. And I, I had that experience where I, I just contacted the Fulbright and I asked them to help me contact this person who wasn't responding and they were great with that. Um, and yeah, I hope I've kind of, I hope that's, that's enough for you. Patricia, thanks very much. And uh, thanks also to Helen. Um, we're just going to move on to the Q&A section now. We have some questions that have come in. I know some of them have been answered on the Q&A part, but I think probably a couple of them are worth just uh, throwing out or highlighting. But just before they do that, I just wanted to, to, to make a couple of additional comments to what the speakers had said, is that um, one of the things I guess we have been saying is that professionals are actually underrepresented, you know, and they are, so they do represent diversity to the programme. And as such, where, where we look for diversity, we have a bias towards diversity. So for people who are not necessarily academics, but coming from a professional point of view, just understand that actually you do represent diversity and there is a positive bias in, in your space. The other thing is that where you have additional information or you have information that you're not sure or you're being asked for information on the application process and you don't have that, for instance, it could be related to a type of publication record. Please instead tell us about your journey and any other relevant information and do that through your CV. That's obviously going to fill out that space. So there's an opportunity to really tell your story and your professional story throughout the whole application process. I have said this many times, but there, and I'm saying it because many Fulbrighters have said the exact same, they've said it back to me, is that there are a few, if any, downsides to applying for a Fulbright, except for your time. If you're not, if you're successful, then that's superb. If you're not successful, you've learned a lot. You've spent a lot of time thinking. As Helen reflected afterwards, it's not it, that thinking about you and where you want to go starts at your application, and then if you're on your award, it continues there. But you could also repurpose a lot of the information you would have developed for a folded application in terms of application for other uh, awards, other grants, or other job interviews, or just a consideration even for an opportunity to reflect on where you want to go and what kind of things you might want to do in the future. So again, this is not just me. I'm only repeating what many Fulbrighters have said to me, that there are very few, if any, downsides to making this application. And most will say, just do it. Don't prevaricate. Don't hesitate. Just do it. It could it could really be a, a, an amazing change, an opportunity in your life. Um, th so that opportunity to reflect is a big part. Now, thank you very much for that little segue. So just going to a couple of the questions that even though they have been answered, I think they're worth just kind of making a commentary. There was a question about the limitations around the host institution in terms of reputation. So I'm not going to address reputation per se, because I think you will obviously have to decide if it's a reputable institution that you want to go apply to. Well, then Assumedly, they are they are reputable. But if you're just asking what type of institution, we're very open. We're very open to that. As long as they had some opportunity for research or engagement or some aspects of programs that you want to bring to them or learn from them, that's or or a type of art that you want to bring to them. We're very open to that. I think you can very strongly make your case. If it makes sense to you, it should make sense to us. So hopefully that gives that answer. Uh, There was a question as well, and I had mentioned it, that if you have uh, a desire to go to more than one institution, particularly if they're within a locale, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have a problem with you spreading your time between one or more institutions. There are actually some uh, Fulbright awards, not necessarily Irish, but that, that that are built like that. So if there's an opportunity for you, again, if it makes sense and that you're not going to... Be, you know your time isn't going to be so broken up that you don't that you don't actually settle in any one place then you know if you have an opportunity to engage with the community then absolutely that's that's something again you can make the case it should make sense to you there's a question there from someone who says they do not represent a diverse group that is fine we do particularly welcome people from diverse backgrounds however 
everyone is welcome to apply for a Fulbright Award. Just in terms of the Irish residents, um, yes, Irish residents, people living in Ireland who have Irish passports are eligible to apply, as are, I think Dara touched upon this earlier on in the presentation. If you're an EU citizen who's been resident in Ireland for five more years, you're also eligible to apply. If you're not eligible to apply to the Irish Commission, Say you have a French passport, you may be eligible to apply to the French um, Commission. So the different commissions have different rules, but you may, if you're not eligible to the Irish Commission, you may be eligible to a different commission. And can I just say a meal of is to Aoife, the communications officer, for making the webinar happen today. Okay. Um, just to add to your comment as well, Paula, about uh, diversity or not being diversity uh, or representing a diverse group, I think it's fantastic if we can get to a point where you're saying you're not representing. I mean, we really do want to diverse, to support diversity until we no longer need to support diversity. Having said that, to quote Monty Python, we're all individuals. So the person who asked that question, I would say to maybe look at the full story about your story and represent that well. If it's your story, it's something you should be able to represent well. So I don't think worry too much about the uh, a diversity tag that you might apply to yourself. We are all individuals. So please do and that. There's, no, there's a question, is there any age limits? No, there's no age limits. No. As long as you have an undergraduate degree. <laughs> So I suppose technically maybe you'd have to be 20, but no, there is no real age limits or age requirements whatsoever. Okay. Okay. So I think we're probably going to take the opportunity just to, to, to wrap the session up. Um, if anybody hasn't asked a question, please reach out to the Commission. Obviously, we say the first place to look through, there's extensive information on the website. Sometimes that can be a, a boon and sometimes that can be uh, something, a little bit of work that you have to do. But there is extensive information there. If there's something you're not easily finding or something that you haven't found at all, absolutely reach out to the Commission. Just to understand, obviously, as we get closer to the closing date, we are going to be busier and busier. So if the information is on the website, you might be quicker to find that yourself. But we are open to trying to to answer questions and I think you know um, Helen and Patricia and any of the other Fulbrighters who've been on this are hugely engaged with the programme so they're going to be there to you know it, it's a pushing an open door I think mainly to ask questions we mentioned the campus ambassadors they're available to talk to anybody you don't have to be on that campus either they are Fulbrighters and they're very engaged and hopefully can be very helpful speak to US Fulbrighters use them as links to getting to institutions in the US. It's a wide, big country. We have a focus for three of our awards we spoke about today, you know, in particular areas, but the professional award and the all disciplines award are very much open to all of the United States. And we would say, have a look at that. You may well be an Irish Fulbrighter in Oklahoma City, I sometimes say, that probably makes you a bit of a rock star. So there's a great experience that you can develop there. So I, at that point, uh, Tanya, is there anything you wanted to finish no, on? No, just, Tara, I think there was a question. There seem to be three questions along the same lines about the number of awards and how many awards you anticipate supporting. Okay, so I saw that one. It wasn't clear whether it said Creative Ireland, but it's, I'm going to answer the part of it that might suggest the, the Fulbright Creative Ireland types of awards. So we would probably have one in each of those categories in also of the four awards. Now, if you apply under the all disciplines, we would have a, many more. So you can, you can apply in, on the all disciplines as well and, and we would have a greater number of awards available on that. Yeah, and I think I would just add, like if Dara will, has in the past approached us, if there's some really outstanding applications and there's a reason to go for more than one with a particular institution or more than one professional, we, we would certainly be open to that. But really, we, we have no role just to your work here in the selection of the candidates. So that's completely done independently as it should be. But then they will approach us if there's like outstanding applications that it will be a terrible shame. We would certainly see could we get some additional money. Thanks, Tanya. You've said that live on, on web, so we have that nailed down. Thanks a million. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again, Tanya. Thanks very much, Helen. Thanks very much, Patricia. You know, you've uh, proven the point I'm trying to make, which is that it is very much a, an engagement and an ongoing family, uh, you know, so we're delighted to have had everybody here. Thanks to Paula and thanks to Aoife. And hopefully everybody watching this now is now motivated, has already trying to take down the US or, well, first of all, contact us and then try to take down the US system by making so many applications from the creative Irish space. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.